This episode is brought to you by Meow Wolf. Come creative, leave creative. October is the cosmic howl at Meow Wolf Denver. Take our immersive experience and add a splash of strange enchantment with events, workshops, and other special surprises. Get your ghoul on with events like Adultiverse, where the wild things roam, only for the Gronly on October 16th. Costumes are encouraged. Must be 21 or older. Learn more at meowwolf.com slash cosmic dash howl. That's meowwolf.com slash cosmic dash howl. Today on CityCast Denver. One of the country's last remaining lesbian bars is right here in Denver on Colfax, but not for long. Producer Paul Caroli and I are talking about Blush and Blue's controversial past, a very suspicious new op-ed about the proposed slaughterhouse ban in the Denver Post, and a parking mystery on Brighton Boulevard. And hey, we noticed a bunch of new listeners arriving. Welcome, and don't forget to subscribe for a daily dose of news and joy about your city. Today is Tuesday, October 8th. I'm Bree Davies, and here's what Denver's talking about. Uh, hey, Paul. What's up, Denver? <laughs> Let me put you on this news today. We got two to three stories of things happening in the city that you might care about. Well, if you aren't as internet... Uh, addicted as we are. Paul is doing an impression of the Denver foodie, a.k.a. What's Up Denver 303, a.k.a. the guy that we skewered mm-hmm. last week for being not very nice to some local businesses. But um, yeah, I, I took a cue from Olivia and started watching people's follower counts on Instagram. Hot tip. <laughs> Check it out. Anytime you see an influencer embroiled in scandal, watch just watch the follower count. See what happens. He lost a couple thousand. Which is something. He was at 220,000. 21. 221. 221,000. He's down to 100. 218. 218. Mm-hmm. So, After we reported on him as well as Jeremy yeah. Hohola at Nine News. Okay. Jeremy's so. piece was good. Jeremy got an interview with him. He did. And then, I don't know, did you see the one he did, the Denver foodie with where he had a mask on? <laughs> he did some video on some other person's account. This guy's a little bit, I think he maybe probably about a year ago should have hired someone to help him run yeah. this account. Because he clearly has something that people love. Like, he's good yeah. at making the videos. I watched a bunch of them over the weekend, but he is not good at running the business. No, and I really thought about the conversation that I had with Amanda Bittner and Ashley Colfax things. is like, this is a very, it's a very difficult, quote unquote, job. And a lot Hunter, of folks oh are God, doing it yes. on the side of their regular jobs. And so I, I do empathize with him from the stress point, but I have to say his presentation of the situation is not been good no. and he's not done himself any favors and like yeah it, it, you, sure you can't hire a PR company but hire a friend to tell you when you're like you're kind of out of pocket you know when you're being a little bit wild I mean, if you had a team they could have talked about it I don't know this kind of situation is hard to deal with this is like PR crisis control management yes. um, but yeah I mean there's a lot of people he, that he could use some help from right now <laughs> Well, I think the PR crisis management is a great segue into our first story. Absolutely. Yes. Let's talk about it. So this this is uh, one of the country's last lesbian bars is the topic of this story, uh, Blush and Blue. It's on Colfax. It's been there, I think, since 2012. Uh-huh. Um, years of controversy around Jody Buffard, the owner. I'm not, is that how you pronounce her name, Jody Buffard? I believe so. That's I just know her as Jody. That's how we've been pronouncing it, yeah. Um, anyway, she says she's shutting down. And according to Outfront Magazine... Uh, uh, she's reopening a new place with a new name. Bree, what can you tell us? <laughs> well, the the way that this new name and everything unfolded was seemed particularly suspicious. I think, oh, okay. particularly to reporters from this community who've been watching this or reporting on this story unfold. I would say uh, Alex Scoville at Denverite had written a little bit about it, and uh, Ray Lee at Outfront Magazine had been. The details in Ray Lee's story is, are really interesting and kind of helped build out where we are today. Tell but, me. Well, the controversy at this point, we're going to kind of start in the present moment and go backwards. So on September 27th, a new Instagram account popped up called Cox on Colfax with a big muscular rooster uh, mm-hmm. as a logo. It's about a rooster. It's, a, it's not about anything else. Nothing at all. It's about your love of fowl. Uh, but it, they're claiming to be a new bar on Colfax coming this <laughs> October. 
Uh-huh. The next day, September 28th, Blush and Blue announced it was closing after more than a decade in business. And so uh, this reporter at Outfront Magazine did some digging and found that Cox on Colfax, which doesn't have an address listed yet. It just mm. has an Instagram page with a couple posts. Uh, but the owner of that LLC, the LLC behind it is Jody. Interesting. So... Um, also, so why might she want to be doing something like this? Right. Why I mean, she's so famous for running this one of the few one of the lesbian last bars lesbian, in the country. Yes. Yeah. And well, okay. So let's go back all the way to 2021. Our former producer, Alexander McMahon, reported on some former Blush and Blue employees who were suing Buffard for alleged wage theft and racial discrimination. Um, the case was apparently settled in 2023, but then in 2023, another employee came forward. Settled. Yeah, so it, it was hard to find information on the settlement, but according it tends to, to be. but I thought that that's what I thought too. And I don't know if this person was part of the settlement because they shared information that seems like it would not be public. Um, but Rayleigh at Outfront Magazine reported that uh, Becca Schechter, a former bartender at Blush, led the boycott. So she led this current boycott that's been going on, but she also shared that the, the First lawsuit ended with a sixty thousand dollars settlement across thirty three employees. Whoa, which is not very much money. Um, but I thought that was interesting. Yeah, interesting. I mean, wage theft has been such a big topic recently in Denver since we've empowered the auditor's office. Yes, and I can see this only getting more. Jody's problem, I think, is timing. You know, <laughs> last lesbian bar in the country, wage theft before it was even less cool. I know. She's just the head she of the curve, moments. I guess. I mean, I, I can see where, and this is coming through in the reporting, the community itself, particularly mm -hmm. like the, the folks that were going to the, when the lesbian bar iteration are kind yeah. of feeling like, is there just a rebrand coming on? I, that's what exactly what it sounds like. It, it sounds like she's like rebranding re Blush and Blue as Cox on Colfax presumably a gay bar have we said that yeah we we haven't Do we but know that yeah, i think it says that's its description on instagram okay. is right. a gay bar coming to colfax yeah gay bars are not lesbian bars let's be clear it's a different clientele um this bar from there's just not a lot of information out there it seems like they're catering to sort of the cis gay male community we don't know but that's kind of what it looks like guess we'll see it's like what do we have a one in one out policy for queer bars like well <laughs> we're closing a lesbian bar so we're opening a gay bar like can we not yeah. just have both that's fascinating to me that this is what she chose but well, she's she could have chosen a pizza place or like a mexican place you know something with super high margins else yeah anything that like but is she not chose... yes it's like and i will share yeah. um Alex at, at Denver, I shared a list of some other uh, like lesbian and queer owned spaces. So if you're still looking for those kind of spaces, they exist. Do we think that there's enough of them? I don't know. Mm. So that was kind of the other bummer part about this is like, it's already a small represented community. This is right. not make, doesn't make it any better. So right. I don't well, know. We'll keep an eye on that one. Let us know. Do you have any blush and blue memories or, or, or feelings about Cox on Colfax, the new uh, agriculture themed stock show destination presumably for all you beefy muscular Ranch rooster hands. fanatics out there <laughs> very bizarre let us know 720-500-5418 again okay. 720-500-5418 denver's last lesbian bars can we have some more please this episode is brought to you by the denver film festival the Denver Film Festival is back from November 1st through the 10th, and it's your chance to experience some of the biggest films premiering in Denver before anywhere else. There, I mean, obviously, a giant fountain Coca-Cola. Can't not do that. Popcorn. What am I talking about? Junior Mints. Hi. The best. It's the only place I eat. The only time I ever eat Junior Mints is at the movies. It's like, that's where, they're, where they belong. You know what I mean? But here's the best part. It's not just about the blockbusters. The Denver Film Festival is your opportunity to discover hidden gems you might never get to see anywhere else. We're talking indie films, groundbreaking documentaries, and emerging directors. This festival is packed with unique stories that will stay with you long after the credits roll. So don't miss out. Head to denverfilm.org to grab your tickets and get ready to immerse yourself in 10 days of incredible cinema. That's denverfilm.org. We'll see you there. Hi, this is David Plotz of CityCast. Have you thought about a gift for yourself this year? 
one that has the power to help you grow and learn and become a better version of yourself. Give yourself the gift of language by getting Babbel. With quick 10-minute lessons handcrafted by language experts, Babbel gets you talking a new language in three weeks because talking is the key to really knowing a language. And that's how Babbel approaches it. It's designed for real conversation. So I have a trip to France planned with my girlfriend. Was it inspired by the Olympics? Yes, it was. And it's given me the chance to revive my old high school French. And it's so fun to catch back up with the vocabulary I'd forgotten, to remember all the food, for example. I'm in a lesson on ingredients, so I'm going to make crepes with butter and sugar. Avec sucre et de beurre salé, on va se régaler. We're going to have a feast. They learned this great new French expression, too. J'en ai l'eau à la bouche. That means I have water in the mouth. That means it's mouth-watering. Love it. Love French. Anyway, Babbel gets you talking, and studies from Yale and Michigan State University and other leading universities prove that it works. So here is a special holiday deal for CityCast listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for CityCast listeners at babbel.com slash citycast. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash citycast, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash citycast. Rules and restrictions may apply. Let's move on. Next story. This is so interesting. I mean, we've we've touched on the election. We haven't gotten into it as much as we're we're about to. Oh yeah. <laughs> we have twelve measures on the ballot uh, that will impact Denver directly on a variety of topics. I mean, we're talking affordable housing to collective bargaining, but uh, the fight that I think you were really keen on early on yes. that seems to be nastiest so far is over this single business, Paul. It's a slaughterhouse in Globeville. What do you want people to know? What have you found? Well, this it, it, there's been some intrigue recently, and For I've been sure. talking to some people around this conflict. I mean, if this is your first time hearing about the question, I think maybe a little bit of just you know over general information is helpful. This measure got put on our ballots, our Denver ballots only. This is a Denver question; only Denver voters are going to vote on um, by some animal welfare advocates. Their name they go under the name Pro Animal Future. It's an offshoot of this group called Pax Fauna. Um, so they gathered the signatures, the, the signatures to put it on the ballots alongside this fur ban, um, and now there's this much better funded campaign to stop the ban. Um, so that's being funded by like the company that owns this slaughterhouse, uh, Superior Farms, uh, based in California. They have facilities all over the country, but this one here. They uh, slaughter lambs and process them and uh, vacuum seal them in little packages and send them to. We don't have to go into more details I I there. Like, I can you already went see down you grimacing. There, Paul, and I, you're as the vegetarian talking to the mediator. Of course, I just want to cover my ears. I don't want to hear about it. Yeah, I I, uh, I got really into this, and I talked to a bunch of people, and then I was like, people don't want to hear the details of this. So I think we should Our just talk about ignorance. the politics. Yes. Yeah, and not so much the um, dead animals. Can I say so? This slaughterhouse, this ban, this ban on slaughterhouses targets yes. this one slaughterhouse. I actually saw a, a billboard in my neighborhood this. Weekend. From the activists? Yes. They put up five. They and did. they just got funding for two more. So there's going to be uh, seven. I was curious where they were ending up because my neighborhood, predominantly Spanish speaking. Interesting. That is uh, the the workers in this particular facility are predominantly Spanish speaking. Mm-hmm. So I wondered, I'm curious where else those, those uh, billboards will show up. Great point. Because both campaigns are advocating on behalf of the workers. Both campaigns Which I think is the most interesting part of this. The Stop the Ban people, I was at this press conference. They had all these folks from the Stock Show, Cattlemen's Association, et cetera, et cetera, chefs who like serve lamb. And they had workers. And they had the UFCW Local 7 there, which represents grocery store workers and the workers up at JBS. Which is the big the meat packing big, plant in Colorado. The, the, when you the say Brazilian factory owned, farm, yes. you're th- talking about this place outside of Greeley. Yes. So the local is on the stop the ban side, but the animal advocates, they're saying we should shut down the slaughterhouse because it's so bad for workers. So I was like, that's fascinating. Yeah. I mean, I, I see, I I hate to say I see both sides here, but I see both sides here. Yeah. Advocating for folks to keep their jobs, also advocating for folks to not have to do these jobs that can be pretty brutal. Yeah. Yeah. So 
how these workers feel and like who really benefits, like what the situation is there. That's that's for me the key thing that's of this whole of this. Uh, vote. Um, and that gets us to over the weekend, there was an op-ed in the Denver Post with a very familiar name to me, um, Jose Huizar, who I think is going to be some someone people talk about around this issue um, because uh, I learned about him on the Animal Welfare Advocates website. They identified him as a whistleblower, a former worker, and they had some absolutely sen sensational quotes from him on this page about how terrible it is to work in slaughterhouses, how high the rates of PTSD are. And uh, I mean, maybe I should just skip to this quote about why I was so interested in him and why I wanted. So here's here's what Jose allegedly said, according to their website, about his experience working for Superior Farms. He said, a lot of people cope by drinking. The liquor store across the street would cash paychecks from the slaughterhouse, and a lot of guys would go straight over there after work or even on breaks. That escalates to drug use. I had never used drugs before, but I started using cocaine to be able to make it through the shift and marijuana to numb out afterward. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's really heavy. Super heavy. Super heavy. I just... So this, this is a quote from the website. This is a quote that I saw on the Animal Activist website. But this man also wrote an op-ed? Yeah. Okay. So I, I mean, this is where it gets a little confusing because yeah. I, I talked to him about this quote. I sat down with Jose and uh, in his Capitol Hill apartment. And then there was an op-ed with his name on it in the Denver Post over the weekend that identified him as a former worker and lifelong resident of Globeville, which is the neighborhood where this place it's getting is. Getting a little confusing about yes. the facts around the whistleblower. Yes. So who is this guy? Who is this guy? Who is this guy? Well, I learned that he grew up in Globeville. I okay. mean, he doesn't live there now. Um, he works in demolition now. He worked at this place in 1989. It didn't hmm. even have the same owner then. Superior Farms bought this slaughterhouse. Oh, so it's been in the a 90s. long time. It used to be owned by a place called Denver Lamb. And like 70 years ago when it was founded, it they didn't even slaughter lamb there. They slaughtered cows. It was a whole different kind of slaughterhouse. Which makes sense for the area, the history around the National Western and yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. But you're saying he hadn't worked there in a long time. He hadn't worked there in a long time. So like how useful is his perspective anyway? But I don't know. I mean, the op-ed that he wrote was like very much in line with the quotes that he gave. Um, but not to me. When I talked to him, I, he I heard a much different story than what I saw on the website and what I'm now reading in the Denver Post. Like the actual way that he talked about this, maybe this is a good time for a quote, was like, it wasn't that big of a deal. Like the way he was portraying his experience, I mean, one, it was almost 35 years ago. He was a kid just getting out of high school. He got this job from like some friends and family in the neighborhood, just hooking him up for a gig. And he said he worked there for six months and it wasn't for him. Sure. And it wasn't like some horrible, like I scarred for life situation the way he was describing it. He was just saying like, it wasn't a good job for me. And, and when remember, he, this is when he talked to you. When he talked to me. This is what he said. I mean, maybe he's telling a different story to these uh, animal welfare advocates. Maybe he's writing this differently in the Denver Post. But just listen to his voice. Tell me what you think. You know, here's here's me and quote unquote whistleblower Jose Huizar. That's the thing, though. I'm hearing from you is like, I think as soon as they hear what you actually have to say, because I feel like these quotes on the website now, now that I'm actually talking to you, mm -hmm. these quotes maybe got a little bit taken out of context. Or something. But I was like, it was like I said, it wasn't it was like a. Uh, like say you got a job at McDonald's, you're not gonna be like, oh my god, I was, you know, like I was a top <laughs> whatever. But and I was like just six months into it, so it, it was not big to me, and it wasn't something that I was gonna plan on making a career out of. But th these quotes, they they made it seem like you were having like a really hard time, like it was a really hard, like oh, like painful, distressing no, job. No, no. I mean, no, I mean it was a bad experience, and I would never do that again. And for it, I don't eat lamb, you know, and I just choose not to and, but not like so, you know, bad where like, not like, oh, I hated that job and hate the people and no. And it was like I said, it was the eighties. Everybody like did that, like on breaks and whatnot. But, um, yeah, it was just not, it impacted me as far as like, okay, I'm never going to do this kind of job again. And educate myself and move on, but not. Nah. So he says in the op-ed quote, floors coated in blood. 
cries of pain, a stench of death that lingers long after your shift. Several decades later, I'm still haunted by my job at the Lamb Slaughterhouse in Denver. This November, voters will decide whether to shut down the facility thanks to initiated Ordinance 309, which would ban slaughterhouses in city limits. As someone who's walked those blood-soaked floors, I see a chance to wash away a stain on our city. Those are two very different accounts from the same person. I mean, one of them has his name on it. One of them is his voice, who, and I sat across the table from him. Yeah. I'm not saying he didn't write that op-ed, but it sure doesn't feel like him. No, I just mean, like that quote we that also was taken- just know this happens during yeah. politics campaigning season. A yeah. lot of people's names they kind of give to some fight, but they don't necessarily script. I don't know. I mean, I feel I see what you're saying is you sat across from him. You talked to him. That's what he told you. Mm-hmm. This is what we're seeing in the Denver Post today. Mm-hmm. That line about the cocaine, too, though, I thought that was funny from him. He was like, everybody, everybody like did that on breaks and whatnot. It was the 80s. I know, yeah, <laughs> that's... Like, it's not some distressing thing. It was just like, it was the 80s and cocaine was around. There's a there's a 30 Rock joke where Jax is in just out of the frame of a photo of me as a giant wheelbarrow full of cocaine. Like every, You're right. <laughs> every kind of person was doing cocaine in the 80s. So... This is, but this is really interesting, Paul, because we're all going to be voting on this. And these, both of these things, what you played for us and what I read, will pull at heartstrings in different ways, right? Because, mm-hmm. like, some people are saying the workers have it great, and some people are saying the workers have it terrible. And I think the truth is, some workers who are comfortable dealing with dead animals, which some people are, some people aren't. Between you and me, you know, we have our own different, unique relationships. You went and visited the, I couldn't yeah. go with you. I, I like could not bring myself to go with you to the facility. You eat meat, couldn't go and to the I facility. Meat, right. I was a vegetarian for 10 years. I loved it. It was a highlight of my year going and seeing the slaughter. The process. Literally the killing room floor. Oh my God. You know? I would have passed I went. You know what I did when I got home from that tour, by the way? Ate some of your pork chop? Yeah, I made a pork <laughs> chop. I made a pork chop. <laughs> Uh, not like, longtime listeners of the show should know Paul is a vegetarian, but also he and his wife, Megan, buy a pig. Except for the pig, yeah. And they eat the pig yeah. at home. So like when you're working there, you know, it works for some people. It doesn't work for other people, I think. Yeah, man, this is so complicated. They do have like, there are other aspects of this that are just fascinating. Like they have this employee ownership program. We'll probably talk about this later on because that's turning into a bit of a hot topic right now. Yeah, but for sure. The, the Superior Farms people and the Stop the Ban people, they're all saying like, how dare you try to shut down this employee owned facility? These are employee owners and they're, they have, this is such a great job for them. And it's like- I looked into that a little bit. I don't know. I don't know if I agree that I think they're a little misrepresenting that a, a little bit as well. You know, they're they're implying that these people that work there have some say in the sh- in the future direction of the company and that's just not the case. If you work for a thousand hours or 3 years for this factory, you qualify for this program where every year you get a certain amount of stock or like shares in the company. But if you don't make it to a thousand hours or to three years, you don't get the benefit of that. So if you're someone like Jose who like gets this job right out of high school and it doesn't jibe with you, yeah, you're not going to get that benefit. But for those people that are fine with it and can handle it and think it's a good enough job, you're going to get that benefit and maybe you're going to love it. And I have talked to people who do work there and say exactly that. Interesting. It is good though to say, to share that anecdote because We have to understand like anything, this employee, this is not a monolith. There's not one kind of employee that works there like any other thing. And there's people that feel differently about it. You go up to the neighborhood, same story. Some people are like, it's disgusting. I hate the smell. Some people are like, yeah, my uncle worked there. I also just find it interesting that like you had to really seek out these folks. And I am, I mean, it is interesting he did not bed because I don't know. I feel like sometimes the animal people are not representative of the actual people impacted by the work. Oh gosh. Yeah. That's a whole other. Jose actually talked to me about that too. I was like, cause I pointed out like, I think you've been misrepresented. And he was like, yeah, I don't know how I feel about this. I'm like, I don't know how I feel about staying around this campaign much longer. Cause like these, these activists, like a lot of them came from out of state. You know, some of them are from here. I talked to a few that are from here. Which is such a part of politics though. Did you reach out to him after this op-ed came out? Yeah, I did. I told him, I said, Jose, when I left your apartment in Capitol Hill, not Globeville, I, I thought you told me that you were going to take a step back, that you felt a little bit uncomfortable. Maybe you were going to get some blowback. And 
And uh, I saw this op-ed. I was just surprised. What's up? And he said, nah, I figured no drama, no love, but I'm keeping it real and moving forward. The part where they denied I worked there changed my mind. It's not like it was a dream job to fake the funk. Uh-huh. Which I'm not totally sure what he means by that, but I, I, the fact that they are denying that he worked there or that they couldn't find records of him working there, like I, I can see how I would be offended by that too. His experience is real. The yeah. things that he describes in his op-ed and the things that um, the, the way people talk about what's happening in that uh, slaughterhouse right now is, is reflective of what I saw. Like what he that's what, what he I'm wrote. Thinking too I think is it's like real. it doesn't. It's not like there's been huge advances in slaughterhouse technology in the last forty or fifty years that wouldn't that would change things so much that his experience would be that much different than someone working there today. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about that at a later date. There's plenty more to say. Maybe we'll talk about it on October 17th. Hey, October 17th. We're having an event at Town Hall Collaborative, and we're going to go in depth on some of, maybe all of the 12 local ballot measures and give some hot takes, some thoughts, what's going to, what we think, you know, how we think these are going to play out. And we're just going to have a really fun conversation. Who's going to be with us, Paul? We have got uh, a couple of our favorite regular yeah. guests on local politics stuff. One of our new favorites, Deep Singh Badesha at Deep Not Shallow on X slash Twitter. Um, he's going to be there. He's excited about making predictions. I love making predictions. So I, I think that's going to be fun. And then Westward editor Patty Calhoun. Who knows this stuff better than Patty? I know. I was going to say she's seen so many measures come through I'd be curious her take so yeah. we're going to be talking through it bring your ballot if you want or just take some notes or just whatever but we want to talk about the ballot with you because we're really excited for this election and how what it means for Denver um, we'll put a link in the show notes it's free but we would love for you to RSVP so we can make sure we have room for everybody this episode is brought to you by BetterHelp October is the season for wearing masks and costumes, but some of us feel like we wear a mask and hide more often than we want to at work, in social settings, and around our family. Therapy can help you learn to accept all parts of yourself so you can take the mask off because Halloween masks should be part of a fun costume, not your daily life. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. All you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Take off the mask with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash CityCast to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash CityCast. Oh, it's such a clutch off-season pickup, Dave. I was worried we'd bring back the same team. I meant those blackout motorized shades. Blinds.com made it crazy affordable to replace our old blinds. Hard to install? No, it's easy. I installed these and then got some from my mom. She talked to a design consultant for free and scheduled a professional measure and install. Hall of Fame son. They're the number one online retailer of custom window coverings in the world. Blinds.com is the GOAT. Shop Blinds.com's primetime kickoff event. Save up to 50% off select styles, plus doorbusters. Rules and restrictions may apply. Well, Paul, before we go, should we hear from our beautiful and hilarious listeners? My favorite part of the show. Okay. We've got a voicemail from Aaron. Hey, CityCast crew. My name is Aaron. I live in Arvada, and I work downtown Denver. I'm walking into Mission Ballroom right now, and I know how much you guys like to talk about parking, and this situation is wild. I just passed by the parking lot that's next to the venue. It's half full. There's several giant dirt surface lots that are available, also mostly empty. And there's no parking garage. And the event parking, you know, nearby is $20. What's up with that? Can you guys find out? Thanks. Aaron, you thanks do, for listening. You do know that we you love... You know the show <laughs> so well. We could have a separate segment every week called parking. Maybe we should. <laughs> It's a great idea. I so, love talking about parking. He's observing that they have lots available and they don't seem to be being utilized. Yeah, I have a theory about this. Okay, what's your theory, Paul? I think Aaron was going to Yimby Chella. <laughs> I think they take he was they seriously, transit. It was absent what he was uh, going there for. Yeah. So you think it was just all the Yimbys who love to ride their yeah, bikes they rode and their take bikes. public transit. Check out the bike racks. They're probably loaded up, Aaron, <laughs> on the other side. 
<laughs> no, I don't know. I mean, I've never been to Mission Ballroom. I do know this area of uh, up along Brighton Boulevard. Oh, I do very well. And I remember when they were like building all this stuff, they were talking a lot about making it transit accessible. Um, yeah. They have that like walkway over the train tracks. And I mean, I've never seen a single soul on Me it. Me either. I've walked across it one time. Really? Maybe accidentally. I can't imagine. I, it's so high. It it's looks crazy. so tedious and like... It if is, I'm going to one neighborhood, I'm going to one neighborhood. I'm not going to like, it's not one contiguous like. You know, the only other place I've ever witnessed one of these is at across Wadsworth Boulevard in Littleton yeah. where it's like, it's the only way for you to cross or you'll die. Mm. Um, but I, what I think this, I would love to hear from folks who go to Mission Ballroom. Please. How do you get there? What do you think about it? Uh, location wise, parking wise, what are your thoughts on that? Because I have to say, I mean, embarrassingly, I hate to admit this on the air, but I have not been to Mission Ballroom yet. Mm. I know. I know I've been suspiciously absent of any shows there. So I don't know what the regular grind is like when you go to a show there, but I'd be curious what people think. What yeah. are your what are your thoughts on how parking is down there? Give us a call on the parking all the time everywhere outline 720-500-5418 and let us know what you think. Well, thanks, Paul. See you next time, Bree. That's all for today here on CityCast Denver. If you enjoyed the show, why not take a minute to tell your friend going to Jack White's secret show at the Bluebird tonight about us. Rate the show wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to our morning newsletter and learn more about us at denver.citycast.fm. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. 